having specific indicators of 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 of, of, of compromise uh, or malware information. But that was really a long time ago. On the session of today, you'll see that MISP uh, is really a, a versatile platform that you can use to share any information you like. Um, so it can be intelligence at large. Um, we have some nice example in, in, in the intelligence community how MISP is used to share on a day-to-day -day basis uh, information there, uh, such as uh, people, vehicles, and additional information that are not say, cybersecurity related. Um, thing that is quite important, MISP is really a strongly uh, community-driven uh, development. So meaning that the session of today for us will be a way to gather feedback. Uh, it could start from bug reporting up to uh, new feature requests or contributions or specific things that you want to, uh, to see. Thing that you have to, to keep in mind, this session of today will be a kind of short sessions. Uh, as, as you see, we have no close to 250 participants now. Um, but the thing is, um, there are many other things or collateral and uh, connex uh, project to MISP. Uh, those projects are available too. Man majority of those projects are open source too. Uh, so we might not be able to cover every single thing. But if you have any specific questions, we can even answer later or even answer back on specific issues on, on, on the MISP uh, repository on uh, GitHub. So really for us, it's really important to, to basically have feedback from, from the different users. And someone is writing on the screen. Uh, so that's, that's great. Thanks for that. Yes, you can annotate if you want, but uh, I might I might shut it down if you if some people are using it. Um, so just a bigger background. So Sami and I we do work for the uh, Computer Incident Response Center in Luxembourg. So we are uh, served with national responsibility in Luxembourg, um, and we basically do incident response. That's one of our activities. The second activity that we have is. Um, designing tools, an open source tool for incident response, threat intelligence and information sharing. And the session of today is one part of this. It's basically a, a training session about how MISP is used and so on and how you can use it. Um, as a third, we basically use MISP to share information. So we, for example, share information with the private sector. We have dedicated uh, MISP community for uh, actually sharing information with those different communities. Uh, and that's the thing that's quite important to in addition to develop the software, so Circle is basically developing the software, we are actually users of the software, which is quite important for us because it's, it's a way to um, obviously use our own dog food, uh, use our different tools, uh, and to validate or at least to basically use what we are uh, designing on a regular, on a regular basis. Um, so, just for your information, and that's quite important too, there's some discussion sometimes and we get some requests of, of, of joining MISP communities, what is a MISP software and so on. So, first of all, MISP is a software, an open source software that everyone can, uh, can basically use. Um, and in addition to that, so I can mute some more people, I think. Um, so, in addition to that, MISP, when you run it, is basically building and creating communities. Um, to, so that means the software itself is, is basically an enabler of creating information sharing community. And that's, I think, quite important there. Um, when you download the software and you start to use it, you basically build the sharing communities. And then it's up to you, to your organizations, to decide if you want to have more users going into uh, your community and to interconnect other MISP instances to bridge those different communities. Um, so, as Circle, we basically operate different MISP communities in addition to develop the software. Uh, maybe some of you are eligible to join one of our communities. In addition to that, you might want uh, to run your own community. So, it's really a, a matter of obviously independence. Everyone can basically run the software, start their own community, and start to share um, globally. Just for your information, the funding of this project is uh, through different kind of funding. We have own funding from the Luxembourg State. We have military funding to NATO, and we have additional funding from uh, different private uh, partners and so on for developing the software. So we have, uh, uh, we say, different sources of funding to ensure the um, uh, activity of the, of the project on uh, the long terms. So first of all, what is MISP? Uh, so MISP is a, what we call nowadays a threat intelligence or threat information sharing platforms. Um, everything within the MISP project is open source. Um, and that's something that we really want there. 
Um, if you contribute back to the MIST project, you become a contributor, but you become a co-author. So that means you can, we cannot change the license of the software. It always remains to be an open source project. So that's really, really important for us. Uh, and we have this kind of, of, I would say, a root model into the MIST project to ensure that the software on the long term is uh, an open source project. So first of all, one of the key elements of MISP is the ability of collecting information from different ways. Um, we will go through these different ways today. So uh, you can, for example, enter manual information. So you can get data from uh, additional feeds. It could be um, OSIN feeds, it could be proprietary feeds, it could be commercial feeds, and so on. And you can basically get those informations into from different tools too. So you can automate this kind of information and that collecting this information into uh, directly into, uh, into MISP. Then when you have all those informations, obviously you have to do something with it. And the first thing is to normalize informations. Um, this one is a key element, especially if you want to have uh, support for uh, correlations. Um, so the thing is, is, for example, if you basically get information from third parties, uh, you might want, for example, to ensure the phone numbers that you get or the uh, IPv6 addresses are always following the same rules. And that's why in, in this period, this ability of, of normalizing these information. Then one of the, I would say, golden or at least super important features in this is the correlations. It's where you benefit from actually entering data into MISP. For example, if you have a tool that is automatically collecting phishing events, and at the same time, if you have an analyst working in a case and you have correlations, it's basically automatically expanding the additional information from a specific events that you uh, are already working on. Um, so it's, it's really important. It's, it's really giving a way to uh, actually um, correlate these informations and, give, and create enrichment. Um, in addition to that, the enrichments around, the, around MISP, you have additional modules called MISP modules, which uh, contains more than 250 uh, enrichments nowadays, but you can do additional enrichments. Maybe some of you are familiar, familiar with Google Virus Totals, with uh, Gray Noise, for example, CrowdSec, whatever. Um, you have already existing modules in this to support that uh, and to do this kind of expansions. Obviously, when you start to have like information that are valuables, contextualized, and so on, what you want to do is to collaborate on it. And that really is, a, the, I would say, strong factor of MISP is enabling these collaborations. And this collaboration can be seen not only within your team, but you can collaborate among other teams or even, even different, uh, across different sharing communities. And that's basically all um, MISP is working. Um, so that's really important for us. Um, then when you have this kind of information where people have collaborating and so on, you have valuable and information that you can use or intelligence that you can use to basically feed your systems. And that's really one of the key elements is you can complete uh, have the complete pipeline to have the trade intelligence information up to the actionable information. And if you have to feed, for example, to endpoint protection device, CM for doing a lookup search, uh, creating firewall rules and so on, you can do the full chain with MISP. And that's exactly what, what, are, what is our goal as a third. When we share indicators of compromise, for example, we want to be sure that the end receiving organizations is able to act on these informations and being able to uh, feed additional information and so on from different third sort of parties. So that's quite quite important. Um, so that's <laughs> the core, I would say, core element of um, of MISP. So who uh, is actually using MISP? Uh, there are different kind of users. Uh, over the time, there is an evolution of the tools and the different users uh, uh, increase uh, because they uh, cover the tools is able to cover different use cases. Originally, the, the main user were the malware reverser, instead of response, which were basically sharing what they discover, what they were working on. But in addition to that, we have more and more people starting to work on a day-to-day um, um, miss for additional things, like, for example, regular analysis. Uh, more you gather information, more you get this correlation, and then you can start to basically see much more information about what the attacker is doing, what are the trade actors uh, in place, what kind of campaign it is. Uh, you can even detect adversar adversary group on the lo long term. Um, so it's, it's really becoming a tool that is useful for the intelligence too. Uh, in addition to that, um, a lot of organizations are, are basically connecting to different sharing communities 
to be able to bootstrap their analysis. Uh, the, the, I would say most common use case is the law enforcement, where basically law enforcement is using it in a way to detect automatically when they seize machines, but finally those machines are all, already been compromised. But, <coughs> sorry, when you gather more information, you are able to basically uh, create um, uh, risk or situational awareness that help you to find out what's going on in your infrastructures, in a specific community, or even in a specific sector of activity. Um, so that's, that's quite important for us um, because it's, it's basically um, different use cases and different kind of user that are actually using MISP uh, on a day-to-day -to -day, um, basis. Uh, nowadays, MISP has a very uh, flexible model for uh, data exchange. Uh, Sami was mentioning the MISP core format, which is a format that we developed like more than 20, 10 years ago. This one is very stable and we have a lot of extension around it. Um, for us, it's quite important because it means that a lot of tools can use it, uh, reuse it uh, for ingestions or even for producing data. Um, this MISP format is, is completely compatible and even uh, provide a quite a nice extension on sticks. Uh, so we have a specific project called Mystics, which is related to the format itself, um, allowing, for example, Miss communities to share with other communities uh, information and so on, and even to extend it to very specific use cases. Um, recently, for example, we uh, add a specific object for signal uh, analysis uh, called CGMF, which has nothing to do with cybersecurity, but sometimes it's mixed. So you can, for example, have radio signals in Mist that you share along with cybersecurity indicators. And you can do it with a flexible format. Um, just a, a quick note of all the development of MISP is doing. Um, it's it's really a pretty large project nowadays. Um, so for us, it's quite important to keep track of, of what is the future roadmap and especially the future development regarding MISP. But for us, we need to prioritize the different kind of feature requests that we have. And what we try to do is to basically gather this from different channels. The session of today is one channel uh, to obviously get information from uh, from different users. But in addition to that, um, they are national user groups. So if one of your country, for example, you want to set up a, a user group, uh, you can do so. Uh, we, we, we support many of those in different countries. Uh, the idea being is the following. You basically have a group of users in a specific country or in a specific sector. And then on a regular basis, we collect the request of requirements and so on that would help us to uh, define what are the, I would say, more uh, important features that we want to implement into, into MISP. Um, we have uh, the CTI Summit, uh, which takes, take, take place in October in Luxembourg, next to the ACT de Telu conference, uh, which is another way to, to collect use cases and especially to see what kind of software and, and how people are creative to create new interactions with MISP. Um, it's quite interesting because for, for the past year, we have seen a lot of different use cases. Uh, and for us, it's really important to, to gather such kind of, of things. And for the session of today, I'm quite impressed because we have more than close to 300 people joining the, the session of today. So that's great. And, and welcome for the new joiner of the, of the session of today. Um, so again, don't hesitate to ask any questions uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, myself or one of my colleagues will uh, directly answer. Um, uh, just passing by some some detail about the CTI summit and ACLU, that is one way for us to to gather uh, uh, use cases from MISP, but to see what uh, organizations are actually doing with MISP, uh, which is very important for us. Um, I don't think that it's quite important to um, we gather information through our partners. So we have uh, uh, what we call MISP professional services, and people can uh, even uh, fast track specific requirements through those kind of uh, uh, third-party services. So, and I mentioned this one and this part because it's basically the uh, sometimes the disillusions of information sharing. Um, we might have different use cases and how we share information between uh, detection, blocking, or performing intelligence. So you have to keep that in mind. So in this, what we try to do is to be sure that all those three groups that are actually using information intelligence in a different way can still benefit from it. And especially that sometimes, uh, you might share intelligence or indicator of compromise or TTPs or informations who missed for end users that are just doing detections. But on the other hand, you might have organizations that are actually doing it for blocking uh, things. So for example, for injecting to firewalls, into endpoint protection device and so on. 
But by doing so, uh, you might end up into the kind of conflictual information, so especially that you might deal to have uh, you might have to deal with uh, a different false positive rate. Um, so we have pretty advanced model in MISP uh, to detect such kind of, of warning list and so on, and to pre-filter or filter such kind of information before being ingested. Um, it's it's really important there uh, that you know about those kind of features if you want to uh, basically have a constant stream of data for your automation, for example, which is kind of high quality. Um, so in this period, these kind of models where we think that, okay, it's fine to ingest the data, but if you make it available through the API and so on, you filter all the data um, to make it uh, to make it better. Um, so keep, in that, keep that in mind when you produce information that might be shared in the sharing communities, not everyone has the same, I would say, use case or uh, use final use of the data that uh, you are sharing uh, through those kind of communities. So keep that in mind, it's important, um, and especially to contextualize information. Um, uh, today, Sammy will show you some example of contextualization, and this is, I think, key element for ensuring the data is, is, is reaching a certain good quality and especially a way to be filtering in or filtering out of a pipeline process or an intelligent process. So just to keep in mind uh, all large MISP is used, so you have plenty of communities worldwide using, uh, using MISP. Uh, those different communities are using for sharing information. Um, just as an example, we, we operate a, a private sector community, which is pretty large nowadays, and I think even those information on those slides are a bit outdated, but we have more than 2,000 organizations there uh, that are actually sharing um, indicator TTP, trend intelligence on a daily basis uh, from different kind of sector activities. Um, there are plenty of, of use cases of MISP, and that's maybe for the new user of today, you might want to start your own trusted group or your own private club of sharing information. I mean, if you spin up a MISP and start to, to basically have this kind of platforms for your own community, you can do it. Um, but you have other organizations that are, uh, I would say, more secretive or that are more uh, bound to specific confidentiality agreements or classified network and things like that. Um, so you can have, for example, MISP instances that are completely disconnected from any networks. Um, that's another way of, of using it. Um, the model of MISP allow have kind of hybrid uh, kind of sharing of information. So you can have, for example, trusted groups that are partially connected with other groups. Um, so allowing to synchronize in one way the information, but not share back the other information. You can even cache some information and uh, get it back into your uh, uh, community. Um, so you have really different models. And the thing that is interesting too, over the years, we have seen different community that are being created. Some communities are, are, are just, I would say, uh, uh, I would say, legal things that are Isaac or national censure and so on, but you might have that are really uh, focusing on a specific topic, for example. So we have seen some community where MISP are used for a specific topic where they share information and so on. Um, and you have even security vendors that have their own MISP instance, uh, sharing, for example, I, I know the Nidier, uh, provider which is actually sharing the Yara rules into MISP so like that uh, customers can see the rules, validate those uh, and do some tests in addition to that. So uh, keep that in mind, a MISP instance can be set up in different ways so you can really, uh, you are really open to create your own communities. Maybe some community that we co-manage and in MISP you have a community page uh, so you can even request access to existing community if you don't have any access to, uh, to specific MISP uh, uh, instances. Um, so, for example, we, we even set up a MISP instances during the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, um, which was basically sharing information about COVID itself and cybersecurity related things related to COVID, for example. Um, things about sharing, uh, again, I'm going back on that point. Uh, MISP can be used in different ways, so sharing can be at different level. You can, for example, share uh, within a specific community or a specific team. You can share among different islands of different information and so on. So you are in control of the information sharing aspect. Um, but the main aspect there is, is the trust between people. And what we have seen over the years is a lot of organizations are sharing, but in trusted communities, which makes sense. It's very human, I would say. Um, they create their own social uh, circles, and those social circles are actually sharing information. And this is just a support tool for that. Um, but sometimes, uh, organizations are afraid of, of building a sharing communities for different restrictions um, due, for example, for legal aspect. Um, the first one, and this one, I think it's, it's, it's a topic that we did work on on the past few years, um, especially on, on the privacy aspect. Uh, so if you are curious, we have a, 
compliance pages on, on the MIS projects. Um, if you have uh, lawyers or legal advisors in an organization asking you questions about the GDPR, for example, if you are based in Europe, that's exactly where you want to go. Uh, on this page, you, you actually have um, policy document that we uh, evaluated with uh, lawyers and legal advisors that help you basically to build your own communities. Um, so have a look at there. We are covering different uh, regulations. We have a recent one for DORA, which is an European directive for the financial sectors. Um, and we already covered a lot of cases. So the legal restrictions is technically not a restriction by itself, but it's sometimes even an enabler to uh, be able to share information. In addition to that, there are a lot of, of, of organizations that are will, not willing to share because they don't know what to share. So what we did uh, for the past year is to extend this to uh, be able to share different kind of information. And you'll see that the tool is versatile enough to not only share structured information, but you can, for example, share uh, human readable report, uh, Markdown report, and, so. and you can even bound those two together. So you can add the indicators next to a Markdown report, uh, uh, Sami, which is crazy about it, we will we show some, some example about, about this. Um, it's, it's quite important because that means MISP can be used not only to share indicator itself, but you can add report, you can add correlation there, you can add specific um, label on the textual. And if you have uh, only something that's a work in progress, you can start to share certain kind of information. So you have plenty of way of sharing. Another example too is the sightings. Uh, sometimes you have organizations that have don't share any information, they just validate the information. And that has a way to contribute. So you don't have a single way or one way to contribute, but you might have a different way of contributing back into, uh, into uh, a MISP instance. And I think that's quite important too. Uh, our model is not tied to the format. Um, so if you want to create your own object, your own model, uh, you create, for example, your own classification scheme, you can do it. So you can basically customize everything around MISP. Uh, to be able, able to fit your own models. And that's, I think, quite important because obviously the model of classification for a military organization is completely different from a financial sector organization. So we have this ability in MISP to basically create JSON files which are used to create new taxonomies, what we call taxonomies, which are basically label or uh, classi uh, classification like galaxies, which are, I would say, um, advanced label with a complete uh, knowledge base. Yeah, but I will come back to that on, on that specific, uh, specific point. So just to be clear on the project itself, what we are actually doing and uh, how the project is split nowadays. Um, so we have basically four pillars in the project. The first one, and I think many of you maybe know already, um, MISP is an open source uh, project. So we have plenty of open source software. Um, and those software are basically split in multiple repositories. We have more than 70 repositories on the MISP project uh, uh, page on GitHub. Uh, but obviously, there's a MISP core software, which is basically the API backend software of MISP. And then we have additional software like MISP modules. It's a nice way to extend MISP without even touching the core of the system. Um, a lot of, 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 um, of uh, modules and so on are available there. Uh, for expansion, they are linked to some known services or expansion services that are available, you have a new export format and so on. And you can write your own modules, for example, in, in 40 or 50 lines of Python code. So it's a nice way to extend it. Then you have PyMISP. So um, this one is kind of the companion to MISP, but it's the most actively used for interacting between MISP and other systems. It's basically a Python library to interact with the MISP API. So the MISP API is pretty large for you have an API, open API specification, so you have a Swagger file with all the API of MISP. Uh, but sometimes it could be a bit cumbersome to look into all the API requests, but PyMISP is doing kind of Python-esque versions of interacting with the API, uh, which is helping a lot. We have a lot of Jupyter notebooks about documentations. On this session of today, we will not go into the API, but we have plenty of material there. On the page, on the edge doc that we have, we basically have this kind of uh, uh, all the detail there. Um, then you have plenty of other tools. I will not mention the other tools, but you have plenty of other tools that are related to MISP or interconnecting to MISP, uh, uh, which is basically fitting different needs. Then we have to create with what we call the knowledge base. Uh, I was quickly mentioning just before uh, what we call taxonomy. So taxonomies are libraries of uh, classifications. Um, they are pre-built in MISP, so there are around 250 uh, taxonomies, but 
Uh, usually on a community, you enable like, I don't know, nine or 10 uh, taxonomies, uh, but it's really a very nice set of, of taxonomies that are already existing uh, based on standard, based on some organizations uh, and so on. Uh, but you can even create your own and you can even cherry pick or subselect specific tax and taxonomies out of it. In addition to that, we have a set of galaxies. Um, just maybe for the one that know Maitre attack, for example, Maitre attack is a galaxy. Um, so the complete Maitre attack is updated on automatically in MIST and it's based as a galaxy. So you have this matrix slide where you can define the different techniques of an attacker uh, at different stage of an attack uh, in the MIST event, including uh, uh, an indicators, object, or the event itself. Um, then we have a specific list that are uh, what you call warning lists. It's, it's, it's those lists that are uh, automatically generated for um, uh, filtering out potential false positive. For example, we have a list of bank URLs, bank domains. Um, we have additional lists like well-known IP addresses from Microsoft Office 365, things like that. Uh, this kind of knowledge base can be used by MISP but can be used by many other tools. So don't be afraid of, of having a lot of the MISP warning list. Uh, by default, in MISP is not enabled. You just need to check the box, enable it. Um, but if you want to extend those, it's super easy to. Um, and it's really a way to increase the quality of, of your feeds and the quality of your uh, information share by using the uh, uh, different knowledge base. Um, I, I didn't mention it, but um, we have other, I would say, predefined uh, library um, for example, we have a predefined library what we call Blueprint for Workflows. Those ones are available already in advance to, to cover the different use cases of actual workflow in MISP. Um, so there's a complete free features in MISP for doing workflows, so to basically control the publication of data and so on. Um, this is based on some blueprints that are available uh, and that you can contribute back there. Then in addition to this knowledge base, we have the standard itself. Uh, I was mentioning that. Uh, so you have the core format of MISP, which is an IoTF standard. But in addition to that, uh, we have what you call object templates. So those ones are basically templates for the different object, object that you can describe. So it could be, for example, malware, IP addresses. Uh, it could be files. It could be uh, a lot of things. Um, and you can extend that. Um, so you're not bound to the format that we have, but you can extend. For example, we cover all the sticks to that one object in a, a, as MISP object. But in addition to that, we cover many more different kind of objects, um, which can be created by some other uh, additional users and so on. It's, it's quite uh, um, uh, interesting there. And on top of that, uh, we uh, support different communities, um, especially to provide some uh, actual data into MISP. Uh, so for example, we have the circle MISP OS in feed, which is a feed of data. Um, that you can actually use to uh, feed into your uh, MISP. This one is uh, trail intelligence that works out of the box. It's, it's basically free, but it's giving you a hint of how to use MISP and at least one code data. Uh, so it's an excellent example if you want to, to see uh, how to, uh, to use uh, your MISP instance and how to encode the data. Today we will see some example of encoding data and uh, we'll even show some uh, example data. Um, the, we will give access uh, during the session of today to a MISP instance uh, to have a look at um, uh, an active MISP instance that is used for training, and you can see the different objects and so on there. Um, as I was mentioning, we have plenty of compliance documents to, to basically uh, support users for uh, operating a MISP instance. And in addition to that, we have a specific one called uh, Cross Isaac Community Building, um, which is best practices on how to run an Isaac or sharing communities uh, and to be able to, to start this kind of sharing communities. So one of the key elements of MISP is actually uh, sharing, and um, there is more than one way to do sharing in MISP. Um, first of all, it's one way is, is basically creating sharing groups, for example. So you have a way of, of basically cherry picking your uh, favorite organizations or your trust group to create uh, a group of sharing, and you can use in MISP different way of sharing. So that means you can have, for example, things that are wide open. Uh, you can have some additional parts that are limited to specific users or specific group of users. And you can really build your own sharing groups um, within MISP. Um, there are many other ways of, of sharing in MISP. And uh, this is one of the most common ones we, we talk when we talk about anonymized organizations. Um, some users want to be sure that they don't leak their name when sharing information, but they still want to share information. So when you have full anonymization, it's a bit 
complex because the thing is, you don't have any real organization, so you don't know how you can trust this information and so on. But in MISP, we have a functionality called delegations, which allow you to delegate the publication to a third party. So how does it work? It's super easy. You create your MISP event, and we will go back to the data model later on, but you create your MISP event, and you can uh, propose the delegation to a third party organization. So classical example, uh, you are a bank, you are willing to share and get feedback, but you don't want to share under your names. Uh, you might have a banking community information sharing, uh, and you delegate to the banking associations. So that means you delegate to a third party organizations, which need to allow this kind of, of, uh, of uh, publications, if they agree with that, and then you can share this information. So it's a very nice way of um, uh, sharing, uh, sharing information. Um, in addition to that, um, there are plenty of ways to synchronize MISP instances. Um, there are, for example, direct synchronization. So you can pull push complete events. You can uh, select a, a sub part of event to a MISP instances. Uh, you can ingest data from the different feed systems, so from, from JSON, from uh, MISP core format, from CSV, from even from free text, and so on. But you can also uh, share it directly through, uh, I would say, a mechanical way or physical way where you can uh, use RCAP system and inject those kind of systems. And in MISP, you can even mix both. Uh, it's not uncommon that people are starting with an RCAP system and later on they start to interconnect. But the MISP format allows that. So you can basically carry a new MISP event on an USB key or later on, you can just share through synchronizations. Um, and on top of all those kind of sharing, we have filtering uh, to especially avoid that uh, information are shared in a different way and so on. Uh, you can filter also, for example, you just want to share TLP clear information, but you don't want to share TLP red or TLP amber information. And then you can get basically uh, create filtering rules. We have other uh, way of sharing, like what we call caching. Uh, imagine that you have an instance of MISP containing a lot of phishing uh, details. You still want to benefit from that correlation of information, but without polluting your own MISP instance, but you can cache a remote instance. So how it will work, you basically download a hash of set of all the different indicators, and you are able to correlate on that without actually having the data. Uh, so for privacy, it's great, but for performance, it's great too. So you can really benefit from pretty large data set uh, for correlations. And even for large organizations that need to have multiple MISP instances, we have what we call MISP uh, internal enclave, which are a way of describing local instances um, and subsets when you start to have like automated system ingesting into, uh, into a MISP instance. So the thing that are really important in MISP is what you can actually do with the uh, data. So for example, from, from uh, um, correlating the data so to, to manage the quality of information. So for example, Correlation is automatic. So by default, you are correlating in this. And by doing correlations, um, but the, actual, act, the active correlations, it's, it's a way to, um, for example, find out if it's something that uh, someone else is working on, or even to um, have kind of this ambiguity of some information that you receive from another MISP instance. So that's what we call correlations, is a way to correlate so we have two kinds of correlation, perfect match or fuzzy hash. Um, we'll go back to that uh, models, but it's also, I think, key features in MISP. When you start to correlate, you start to, to basically benefit from the other data. Another thing that you can do in MISP is what we call citing. So it's basically increasing the quality because you can even tell someone else that, okay, this data is generating a lot of false positive. So it's a way to feedback or provide the continuous feedback to the other organizations that are contributing data into this. Um, as I was mentioning, we have this warning list system, uh, so you can manage the false positive, and you can filter all the data that you don't want, and you can even sub select some specific warning list if you want to just uh, um, eliminate some, some indicators or thing that you don't want to be ingested into your uh, protection device, for example. Uh, another thing is the enrichment module. So uh, as I said, by default in MISP, you have plenty of enrichment module that you can use. It's super nice. Um, you can really use it to, uh, to gather more information and contextualize information. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting there. Um, another thing that is, I think, important is a lot of organizations are really afraid of leaking information or, uh, or really want to ensure that the quality of information that they are forwarding to their third parties is high quality. So you can have like dual or even triple way of doing uh, validation. So we have these workflow systems 
where you can even block publications, for example, on a V1, if it's not meeting a certain set of requirements, uh, like, for example, classification, specific taxonomies or galaxies or specific contextualization are missing, then you can even review things automatically before publication. So it's a gain of time, especially when you are working in organizations where you have a lot of processes and so on, you can just like describe those processes. It's a very nice way of doing it and, and so on. Another thing is in MISP, you have plenty of integration with existing tools. Um, the API is, is actually used by a lot of tools. If you look at PyMISP, uh, we have hundreds of tools that are actually relying on PyMISP uh, for interactions. Uh, and there's a very flexible API. The drawback of the flexibility of this API is the complexity of it. It's a quite large API, uh, but basically you can do whatever you like through the APIs and controlling ingestions, validations, decaying of indicators, things like that automatically through the API. Um, another thing that is interesting in MISP, you have, uh, I would say, three main views of information. Um, we'll go back to that when we do some demonstrations. Um, the MISP allow to show the information in different way if you, if you have been encoding D one time. Quick example, you enter data into the MISP event, you create a MISP event with some specific information there, and you start to put timestamp there. But automatically, MISP will generate for you a timeline. Um, so like that, you can quickly spot uh, timeline accuracy or inaccuracy through different kind of events. So if you do forensic analysis and so on, it's really a quick, 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 quick game. Um, another thing, and I was quickly mentioning, it's, it's what we call the um, decay of indicators, so the indicator life cycle management. Um, this one is a kind of complex thing because, I mean, many of you may be familiar with that, but the, the main problem of, of um, uh, indicator management is you might have expirations of some, you might have some old data and so on, but this is variable depending on the use case. Um, so in MISP, we have a complete life cycle management there um, that you can actually use to validate uh, and, and exclude some indicators. And this model can be flexible. So you can have different models of, of, of uh, decaying and expiring, expiring some data depending on um, the type. Uh, the, for example, if you have phishing links, you know that those phishing links are not like staying for like months. On the other hand, if you have very targeted attacks, you might have some indicators that are staying for months active, um, but you, you want to have different models supplied. Uh, Miss Palo, that through this uh, kind of, of, of uh, indicator lifecycle management, uh, if you have some times, we might quickly show on, on the interface. So just to conclude on the introduction, this is really, uh, really important. MISP is, is really be based on usage, on day-to-day -day usage. Um, our use case as a C cert and cert is really to share information, to be able to reach out to our constituents that they are able to detect any attacks and so on. Um, so, and for us, the information sharing is really coming from practice and from the usage. Um, so, um, we have seen evolution over times. I mean, if you talk about Sigma rules, for example, like, I mean, five years or six years ago, Sigma rules, Sigma rules were not so common. But nowadays, you see a lot of Sigma rules being exchanged uh, through MISP uh, to, to basically be uh, injected into an endpoint protection device or CM and so on. So really, the practices of information sharing is, is changing the way of, of, of things are, are basically uh, uh, modeled there. Um, another thing that is quite important, too, is, is, is really the MISP contains, I think, around 400 uh, way of, of configurations into the config files. Um, so you can really customize MISP to meet your needs. Uh, don't hesitate to ask if you have specific customization models. Um, they are obviously already a model existing. Uh, so it's, 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 it's not a, a young software. So you have plenty of opportunities there and sometimes they are really hidden. So don't hesitate to reach out if, if at one point in time you want specific functionalities. Uh, that's quite, quite important. And I see Sammy is sharing actually information about um, the Open API. Uh, so the link that he uh, basically uh, shared there is the API, uh, Open API documentation. This one is completely documented, and you can have a look at the different parameters for, for doing research and, and so on. Um, so keep in mind, MISP is not only a, a, an open source software; it, it's really uh, an open standard. It, it's a community behind. We have a, a really active community on, on best practices, on creating knowledge base, and so on. Uh, to actually do information and being a reality. So um, thanks for the one that are uh, today joining us. Uh, it's really uh, for us important to basically, I would say, uh, between bracket, preach the good uh, 
the good way of information sharing um, because it's helping everyone. So if people are start to share information and so on, it's reducing the time that the attackers can uh, conduct their attacks and it's really helping everyone. So that was my quick introductions. Um, now we will uh, pass to, to Sami that will go into uh, more details introductions and then we continue to answer questions on the chat if you have any questions there. Yeah. So maybe we hand over, maybe you could. Ah, yes. We have many questions about this. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so um, we are an open source project. So we are basically funded from different schemes. And we have one scheme called the uh, Miss Professional Services, which is the, the MPS. Uh, how does it work? It's pretty straightforward. So we provide a way that uh, I know for some organizations, for example, uh, uh, using open source software without contract and so on might be an issue. And that's why we have this kind of MPS services. Um, where organizations can purchase a number of tickets and have a support contract with us uh, if they need to have support. Um, so it's, it's one way to uh, secure the open source software development, but at the same time, it's one way for organizations to, uh, to be able to, uh, to basically have a point of contact if something goes wrong or to have a legal binding with an organization when they, uh, they do support. So um, uh, maybe Sammy, you can share the, the link to the uh, Miss Professional Summit uh, pages. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a nice way of, of uh, supporting us, but at the same time to get a kind of support contract if you want to, to get that. So we have one that is directly to us, and then you have plenty of organizations worldwide that are actually supporting MISP and, and providing even support. Um, so uh, uh, we have a list on, on the website about the different uh, um, commercial support. Um, this one is a commercial support page. Uh, the first one is basically us. Uh, for doing the uh, misprofessional services, but if you need additional commercial support, I don't know, in Australia and so on, you have some partner there that, that can do it. So, uh, so it's really an, uh, an ecosystem of, of organizations that are working on MISP and so on. So don't um, don't hesitate to uh, um, to reach out, and uh, we can we can basically uh, help you there. Uh, Sammy, do you have another question? Maybe that uh... Uh, no, I think it's good time to to showcase. Okay, uh, perfect. We will stop the data model and, and then we can move the Sami, you're muted. You're okay. Should be okay now. We can still hear you, but not very good since you are also muted. You cannot hear me good. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's normal that I'm muted because we are using the same system for streaming the sounds, but you should be able to hear me correctly. We can hear you, right. you but okay, as perfect. for me, you are a bit away. From my oh, wait, all right. I will try to close the microphone then. <clears throat> uh, thanks for letting me know. Thank you. Um, so, yes, as I was saying, um, we have developed this cheat sheet. Um, so, during this session, if you have any questions or wondering about some terminology that we use, uh, feel free to, to check it out. So, explain briefly things, for example, what are What's the correlation for the gene? Uh, what is an extended event? What is the action of publishing? What does it do? Uh, synchronization, then a bit of theory about distribution in this synchronization. And then what we will cover now for the next 15 minutes uh, about the MISP data models. So the different structure that we have in this to encode information. Um, all right, so the link is in the chat. Then, 
let's head over to the data let's quick uh, quick module just to show you the jumping that we has um in this technical information and then we go and see a demo on how we can use this structure to encode information and to use it in this but sorry first we have a bit of telly um, so we have two types um we have two types of data modeling list um well two types of layer that's how i like to think things uh, the first one is the data layer. This is where we link on information such as uh, file hashes, IP addresses, URL, domains, and so on. And then we have what we call the context layer, where this one is used to contextualize information uh, by using that. Uh, so let's see this layer one by one, starting with the data layer. So the mainly the, the Basic building block that we have is what we call attributes. Um, these are the, the building blocks used to encode things like I mentioned, like domain, IP addresses, uh, file hashes, attachments, uh, binaries, PDF files, whatever. Basically, anything we we'll encode in this will be most of the time encoded as an attribute. Now, if you are familiar with uh, sticks, um, attributes of what also can be called in sticks as a, an observable and an indicators. Uh, in this, an attribute is both, and the difference that we have between the two is uh, uh, by using what we call uh, the IGS flag. So basically, when you have an attribute with the IGS flag set, that means that this is an attribute that should be considered an indicator, and that should be fed to your projected tools. So, in the case where you want to just have supporting data, you would have also an attribute, but with the IDS flag that set. We'll see example later on during the demo. Then you have a more advanced uh, data structure to encode information, uh, and this is what we call missed objects. So as you can see on the diagram on the right side, a missed object can have multiple attributes. And what it does is basically combine attributes that make sense together, or that, as it says on the slide, that are intrinsically linked together. For example, if you have a file, a file has a content, like the binary representation of the file, a file has a name, a file has different file hashes, a file has a size, a file has an entropy, and you can see all of these things can be expressed as an attribute. So the file name would be an attribute, the file size would be an attribute, the actual file binary would be an attribute, but all of them are linked together. And when you link them together, you form what we call a missed object. So yeah, this is a way for us to structure information so that we can link individual attributes together. Now in MISP, we have, uh, I would say 200, if I'm not mistaken, different type of uh, templates or missed object templates. Um, but the, the cool thing with it is, as I mentioned in the introduction, if you ever need to encode something that doesn't exist in this already, you can always create a new template for that. But this is a bit, uh, not, I would say it's not difficult to do, but this is a bit out of scope for this session. But if you're interested, you can tell the documentation on how to do that. Next, uh, next data structure of encoding information is what we call this event. And it is acting like an envelope to regroup all of these objects and attribute together um, when they are linked into the same context or concept. For example, we use event to encode incident. So if you have an incident, incident in your organization, uh, you would create an event, give it the name of the incident, and then start encoding the IOCs inside this event. Um, if you are browsing, uh, security blog posts and using interactive blog posts with a lot of IOCs, uh, then you would want probably to encode this to encode it as a list event. And so you would create the events and start the encoding as well. So we can use event to encode incident, uh, blog posts, uh, reports, security from security vendors, uh, security providers. Um, we could use event to also save daily dump of IP addresses or financial IP addresses, that kind of stuff. So it's a generic container to encode information. And what you can see by looking at the diagram on the right side 
is that event contain attributes and objects. And it's, you will never have uh, attribute and objects not belonging to an event. So you don't have like floating uh, entity in this, they always belong to an event. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it for that. Um, then we have, I think it's the last one that we will see today, is what we call event report. It's basically like an attribute, but just when called text, so that you can format text using markdown. And in this, you have a built-in text editor to, to encode this markdown report and also to visualize it properly. Then I uh, wanted to quickly show how I don't have the diagram. Um, but that's all right. So we'll head to this one, object references, or also called like a similar uh, relationship. So object references are relationship of a means for you to link entities together. So it allows us to create link between entities to create a graph or to, to tell a story, that would tell a story. You can use that to represent behavior. For example, if you have a malware that tries to check if it has internet access, would then I don't know, do a ping or whatever on an IP address. Then you can express that fact using a real relationship where you would have on the left side the malware binary, on the right side the IP address, and then you draw uh, to relationship between the two saying that okay, uh, this malware connects to this IP address. And so you end up uh, by building this kind of graph that tells the tells a story, uh, where by just looking at the graph in few seconds you can understand the relationship between the different files and different uh, entities. So if we look at it, we we'll start from the left side. We have the world documents, the world document, the file documents that wraps uh, a malware called NCTOR, which in turn stops secondary payloads uh, observed from the bank. And this uh, final payload is connecting to this specific domain. So in just a few seconds, you immediately understand the relationship and what's going on. So now back to the anatomy of an event, just to show you once again from uh, the big picture what we have in this when you encode an event. So first you have all the meta information related to this event. So the title of the event, optional context, who created the event, the distribution level of that event, so how far it can, can propagate the synchronization and who can access to this event. Then we have all the context that uh, would be uh, assigned using taxonomies, galaxies, or free tags. This is the, the context layer, we'll cover that in the next slide. Uh, what we call the intelligence visualization widgets. So it's basically the event graph where you can see all the entities and their relation uh, with their relationships, an event timeline, and the different event reports that you can create using that now. And, and finally, the list of attributes and objects. And now we quickly cover the context parts. Uh, basically, in this, any context that you would attach to to data would be tags. The tags can come from different sources. The first one is free tags. So these are tags that anyone can create uh, without restriction, but that has drawbacks as you will see in a minute. The second one is taxonomies, which are like a normalized set of tags. And the last one is galaxies. It's like the taxonomies, but with more data, like more metadata. So let's see the quick example. So this is free tags, and this is exactly what I was mentioning with the drawback of using it. Um, if you don't use a standard set or vocabulary, you end up in a situation where everyone creates the same concept, but represented differently, uh, which in turn makes automation, uh, exports, filtering, and so on, very difficult to do. That's why we use taxonomies. So taxonomies are tags, but they are coming from a standardized set of vocabularies and uh, libraries. Uh, so if, if you are wondering, if, uh, if you want to contextualize something and you cannot find 
and that would be a tag for it. First, check the tag in this. Um, if the tag is and if it doesn't, then maybe it's time to think about creating a tag in this. Um, but yeah, this is again out of scope for today. But just know that if, if you have a classification that you cannot uh, use out of the box when you install this, then you would need to do a bit of a, uh, of work to, to to make sure that everyone speaks the same language. And finally, the galaxy. So as I mentioned, there are like taxonomies, but with additional metadata. Um, so to give an example, we found on the one with slide, we have a galaxy called um, the country galaxy. And in this country galaxy, we have many entries that we call clusters. And each cluster would be a country. So for example, in the country galaxy, uh, country galaxy we have a cluster called Luxembourg. Uh, and in this Luxembourg cluster, we have more metadata uh, that includes, for example, the language spoken, the, the currency used, the different TLDs, uh, population, and so on. So you have the galaxy, which contain all the entries that we call clusters uh, that has that have metadata. Now to come back to the example that we have on the slide, you can see that it is about the trajectory galaxy. So a galaxy containing all the trajectory that we know of. And then we have the APT29 cluster, which has some meta information such as uh, the state that is sponsoring this trajectory, the confidence that it is indeed this this data is sponsoring it, the different victim that we have, um, and some relationship between other galaxy clusters. And I think that's basically it. Uh, I will skip this correlation bits and quickly jump to the demo. Uh, so so that it's for people that are discovering this, it's usually better to, to see things how it works rather than in theory. Okay, so did we no we haven't mentioned it, how to join the training instance thing. No, we didn't mention it, so feel free to do it. Uh, yes. Maybe just yeah. Yeah, train the page. So this is yeah. the test talk. Ah, there's the windows again in case oh, no, yeah, just, yeah. perfect. So in addition to all the resources and the different link that we have, uh, we also include the the access from the training instance. So you can join the Eplushka to you in this training instance, pick one of these users. So you can take training between one and 50, so I'm going to be 12, and then use this passport, and then you can access this instance and pay along the way. Um, so what shall we do? Just for your information, this instance will be accessible for the next day. So if you mm -hmm. want to play with it during the next day, so feel free. Uh, it, it, it will be open uh, later too. But the mm -hmm. password will be changed next week. Yes, exactly. So when you access it, uh, when you log in, the thing that you will end up on is the list of events that was created by the different users. Um, so yeah, we can see many things. Um, we can see all the clusters and tasks from taxonomies that have been assigned to these events. Um, we can see who created the event, like which organization. And then a bit from the right side, the, uh, the title of the event, so the, uh, a quick summary of what this event is about. So for example, if we have uh, this one you can read fields, very fishing at and targeting telco company in Luxembourg. Um, by just reading it, we immediately know what this is about. And by looking at the context, we can see that we have spear phishing going on, uh, done by email spoofing. Uh, then we can see which sector has been impacted. Um, yeah, who is the target and depends um, technique used by the attackers to actually carry out this attack. Uh, just, yeah, just something to mention on this instance, this is all training data, this is fake data, so do not try to consider it as intelligence and use them as a system to be blocked in that system. Um, so 
Let's have a look at one of these events to see what, what is this all about. So let's have a look at this field provision again by the input Oops. Okay. Let's so we go back to, we are on the event view. So on this view, we, we can see all the meta information related to this event. So once again, we see who created it, who is the owner, with the context attached to this event, the distribution level that we haven't talked much about. Um, but basically, in this, you can set uh, with a lot of granularity who can see the data and how it should be propagated when you are synchronizing it with all of these instances. And this distribution it can be set on the event container, but also on each individual attributes and objects, so that you can really have a lot of granularity and say, for example, that this I will see this and we need to share it with my community. But this one, which I consider as critical, I don't want to share it uh, with anyone unless this and this partner. So this is the kind of thing that you can achieve. Um, yeah, continuing contextualization on the uh, event itself. And then we have the small section about event reports, uh, where you can, as, as it was mentioned, uh, describe using text uh, and markdown information to be attached to this event. So this one, if you click on it, you can see just text. And it's just, uh, as it says, maybe it's a point of work on a board. Um, yeah, why am I taking it? I can also show that you can also edit it using the built-in editor. So this is markdown. So if you are familiar with markdown, you could be like a syntax. But basically, it's a little bit of formatting. Uh, you can also add some heading, some uh, title. So you could do it. Yeah, you can use all of the markdown filter plus you can have these calendars in with re references to existing entities that you have in your event. So we haven't seen it yet, but some attributes like this IP address already exist in the event. But instead of putting it the raw value of the attribute like this, you can also pass and provide references immediately. Yes. And then it transforms these references and templates it. And then you have a nicely rendered uh, interactive report that you can yeah, click and get more information about this event. Now back to the events. So this is the event report that we just changed. And then if we continue, continue to scroll down, we are right at the events table that contains the different attributes um, and the different list objects. So we can see this huge block, uh, blue block, is an object called file. This is a malware sample, so we have the actual malware sample there that we can download if you want to. Then the file name, the MD5, SHA1, SHA3, number 56, and the size in bytes. So we can see all of these attributes thanks to the object they are grouped together. So that when we look at the table, we immediately see that they are related to each other. Because if you would have a huge table of all of these uh, hashes, uh, it would be quite difficult to, to know which file they belong to. Uh, so having these objects are really uh, uh, an essential way to contextualize and to uh, recall and yeah, structure the information. And you can see that you can also attach context to these attributes. Uh, so yeah, in this one, we have some galaxies attached to it. You can see that this malware sample, this malware binary is doing automated exfiltration uh, and also doing exfiltration of the execution. And then if you remember during the small theory part, I mentioned that an attribute can be either an observator or an IOC. And this is based on the value of the IDS line. And you can view 
the, the ideas fell on the female there on the top right side. If it's struck, it means that it is an indicator that should be fed to your collective tool. So, for example, the malware binary, if this is much of malware, this, this is the, the kind of information that you want to feed to your system or to your RDS system so that it is locked whenever you see it or it's locked whenever it gets into the system. Uh, the finding, for example, this is not something that we want to feed unless it's something really specific. Um, uh, like the different file hashes, obviously, if you belong to a malware center, you would want to block them. For example, the size and byte of the actual binary, this is not something that you want to create your collective to. So let's continue to see what else we have there. Um, this time we have Kanye Hub, as you can see, a little bit. Um, and this way uh, can be also exploded into different components. For example, you can explode it and keep only the domain port. Uh, you can explode it and only keep the port port. Now, the interesting thing by doing that is if you have uh, an URL that is using different like, query information on different resource paths, if you keep the URL assist, you wouldn't you wouldn't see a correlation. So you wouldn't see that this specific domain is being reused by another malware and by another campaign. But if you explode this URL into these different components, uh, like we have there, uh, having uh, an attribute of the of that contains only the domain part of that malicious URL is really helpful for correlation purposes. Because then if you have a different file that is uh, served by this URL, or if you have different port that you use by another uh, malware or service or uh, malicious activities, then you would see the correlation. And by seeing the correlation, you can this can provide more context whenever you are doing analysis or when you are, whenever you are doing some investigation. Because obviously seeing that a domain that you don't know anything about is correlating with a domain that was used to do some malicious activity is really revealing on the, the nature of what you have. So for this one, what we have, we have context again attached to the attributes. So we know that this is the two server. And uh, we know that this is the real use uh, that is used for automating and exfiltration. And again, this one, you can see the IDS file that is set, where we are saving and considering this URL as an IOC. The domain should be blocked uh, as stated by the IDS file. And the associated IP address for this URL that is also uh, President uh, has to be blocked. For example, the port isn't in this specific case. Uh, we'll skip this orange uh, orange uh, stuff right now. We'll come back to that later on. So we have also on the file, we have an email address, which is also contained in attributes. Mm, we have a domain ID here. So the main IP are a nice way to combine domain and the IP it will result to at a specific time. Um, then this is a, actually a nice example. We see we have a person. So if you remember in the introduction, we mentioned that this is not only meant for sharing like uh, cyber indicator or anything that is related to cyber security, but it can it can also be used to share uh, other non typical information such as, for example, person. Um, this can be achieved thanks to the use of the NIST project, because we can represent the UK in some of it. So in our case, we have a person, so we have the function of the person, the first name, last name, the email address. Uh, but we have even more, let's say, I want to say weird, but uh, more uh, um, interesting uh, example of this project being used to share non technical information such as, uh, I remember uh, we had some radar signature sharing information, uh, we have car plates being shared, we have C2 that border control being shared. Uh, so yeah, basically anything that, uh, that you can think of, you can share it to in the new project in place. Okay, so let's continue. We have, in this case, you can see there is no blue border among it. 
This is the simple attributes. So an attribute that is not part of an, of an object. And in this case, it's just a reference to CV. And finally, another header. If you are looking closely to these files, you can see that you have, in some cases, uh, some references, and in some cases, saying that this object is being referenced by other stuff. So these are the object references or object relationship that I was mentioning like 15 minutes ago. And this you can see that this one has reference saying that this file was extracted from this, uh, or it was downloaded from, sorry, from this URL, it was exported to this URL, and then it's exporting this CV. But as we saw before, if you have entities with relationship, you have like nodes and links. And if you have nodes and links, you have a graph. And so you can view a graphical representation of this by clicking on the given graph. So if you click on the given graph, you will see all the entities that we have currently in this event and their relation to each other. So when I will create the event file there, um, that is um, that is exploiting this vulnerability. This file that was downloaded on this URL. Uh, this file is used to exfiltrate this information. Uh, we can also see that this file was downloaded uh, on that file. So we have two payloads involved in this case. Um, and then this file was contained within an email address, or probably like a, an email. Um, and that this email was sent to this person. So, yeah, it, it can be useful to express different type of behavior. Uh, I would say when it's, this is another way to add context information, uh, because in some cases, having, uh, having as, it, as it is mentioned uh, yeah, in the chat, saying like, these relationships sometimes can be just reduced after being a tag, but being able to express the fact that something is related to something else is really uh, important in our opinion, especially in a kind of scenario. So we have a lot of buttons that you can interact with to play with this graph, for example, with the display settings, the physics, uh, featuring some data and so on. Uh, but something that I quite like is the history tab. Where, when you have a large graph, in this case it's pretty small, but if it involves like 50, 50 is already a lot, but like 20 nodes, uh, it, it starts to be messy. Um, so you can arrange the nodes, and then they will, uh, once you release the, 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 the click, they will stay in this position, uh, in the same position, and then you can choose to save the state of the graph. You can do it using this. So in this case, we can see that this state, there is a state save uh, like six days ago, one me, and uh, I can choose to restore the specific one. So just to so this is a little bit of the page. So if I drop down even graph, See that it's all mangled, and then I can choose to rest on that specific state that was saved. Just a cool thing to do, especially when you have it for that. Let's continue on our track with the different intelligence visualization we check. Um, we have also the event timeline. Um, so this one shows uh, the, the time at which some uh, entities were bursting and potentially lasting. So in this case, we don't have any any like, data points relative to time set uh, for this one. As we can see, it's indicated by the red border. Um, but we can always like change things. So if we decide to, for example, set we have a small issue with your. There is an issue. Yeah, we have a small issue with your microphone. It seems that you are too way distant for. Mm. And the input is clear on my side, but I'm not sure. Just to be sure that. Uh, 
Okay. Maybe switch microphone then. Sorry for that, but uh, we have some people that we have a good account, but it seemed that someone put it in so nice though. Okay, but now we have an echo. Hello. Should be good. Yeah, for everyone. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Okay, great. So this microphone it doesn't work. Thanks. Okay, I just... Because so, I, I can hear sorry, myself. Uh, so we cannot hear the right so we didn't know that. Stay good? All right, cool. Uh, so where was I? Yes, uh, the timeline. So on the timeline, you can choose, um, you can choose to set, uh, oh, there is an echo. <laughs> okay. Barely an echo, please continue. All right. Uh, so on the timeline, you have, you can set uh, the first scene and last scene for the different entities. So, for example, when you edit an object, you can select at what time it was first seen, uh, what date and what time it was first seen, and what date and time it was last seen. And when you set this uh, data point, then it will be visible on the timeline. So right now we don't we we see all entities with a red, red border because none of them have a first in or last in set. So it's defaulting to the time at which these were created. Um, so which you can choose to do it by hand, so by manually typing the date and time, but you can also use a timeline to interactively uh, set these. So if, for example, you, you would like to say that this domain was first seen uh, the 3rd of August, for example, you can always drag it. Uh, I will just uh, hide anything that doesn't have a first in or last in date set. Uh, and then you could say, all right, that domain was first seen um, on the thir 13th of August. But if you know that it was last seen, let's say on the, on the 2nd of September, you can always drag it. Oh, where did it go? It seems as I said, I clicked on something else. All right, there we go. And so you can always drag it. And in this case, not this one. Um, and in this case, you can see that it's spanning the, the entire date and time that we've set. Um, all right, this one is the same for the person. So I would say most of the time, this is not something that you would uh, encode manually. But in some cases, it's really interesting to do. For example, if you are tracking some, in this, like in this case, some domain or URL that are performing malicious activities, um, and you want to express the fact that some of them are active for a specific time, and you want to express that fact uh, or represent it, then using the first in and last in data points uh, are really useful. Especially if you want to do uh, IOC expiration. Uh, so in MISP, you have a system called the Decking of Indicator. It's basically a system that allows you to do uh, IOC lifecycle management. And this one, this system is relying mainly on the first and or last seen uh, values of your IOCs. Uh, yeah, this is pretty an ad a pretty advanced topic. But it's just good to know that these first in and last in are not just there for representation purposes. They are also there if you if you are planning to do expiration of IOCs done by MISP. Okay, so what else do we have? So we have reports, we have the timeline, the graph. Uh, we also have the attack matrix. Um, so if you are familiar with the at attack pattern from Mitre, 
Uh, this is a representation of the metric that they have, uh, but the colors are coming from the different uh, clusters or tags from the Mitre attack pattern galaxy that have been attached to this event. So in this case, we don't have many, but if you have lots of um, attack used, then you can see uh, you can see it quickly uh, with the matrix. Uh, one cool thing that we that we have in MISP is you can like merge multiple matrix together uh, by just supplying some filtering parameters uh, and a time frame, and by merging it, you can see which technique were the most uh, used. Uh, this can be, depending on the community you are on, this can be useful to identify gaps that you have in your detection capabilities, uh, but also the prevalent attack that are used, uh, prevalent techniques uh, or attack pattern that are used by attackers in your specific sector or country, so that you can put more defenses around it. Um, Okay, and last but not least, the correlation graph. So we've been talking a bit about correlation. I'm a bit surprised that we don't have any because we have too many correlation, right? I see. So if you click on the correlation graph, you see the different correlation that we have. So right now we don't have any because they're all marked as too many. Um, this is a system that we've implemented to avoid like having recursive correlation that would uh, fill your database too quickly. Uh, but we, if we are a bit lucky, uh, later on we will uh, investigate other events, sample events, then we will see some interesting correlation. Um, so what else do we still have to cover? Maybe just one thing. Um, there is a request from, uh, from Stephen, Stephen Payne about URL import via the event report. Uh, so kind of free text import, but three URLs. Uh, maybe if you can do a demo or explain a bit about the free text import, that might be useful there. Yeah, that is a very good point. I wanted to showcase it during the demo, um, but if it's being asked right now, let's do it. I just want to check one thing. Ah, this is cool. Okay, so let me take us a new URL. It would be cool if we have a, a big one. Okay, let's just take this one and let's add some simple parameter, simple query parameter. So in MISP, if you want to encode like an attribute, uh, there are many ways to do it. The, the way that allows you to supply the most, well, the complete uh, set of option uh, is by just clicking on add attribute there or add attribute there. You have a lot of different fields uh, to fill out. Uh, and it's kind of annoying because first you have to paste or to, to enter the value. Then you have to select a category in which this attribute belong to. So in our case, it would be network activity. Then you have to select the type of the attribute. This is a new hell. And then potentially uh, specify which distribution you want to use if this URL should be marked as an IOC, so by enabling the IDS flag, uh, provide some contextual comment if you need to, and then you can hit submit. Uh, so let's do it. So you can see it takes a bit of time and it's fairly annoying to do, but there is a faster way to do. And we just completely remove it. And this is by using the free text import that was already mentioned uh, in the chat. So you can use a free text import by clicking on this small button. It's called populate using the free text import tool. And there you can simply paste a list of IOCs uh, in this text box and it may try to automatically, automatically detect uh, and extract these, the potential IOCs that you have. So we have uh, we have URL support, and you can paste the URL. Uh, we could also try with uh, an IP address. Uh, and then to confuse it, I will try uh, to put a domain like circle.lu. Uh, 
or maybe not just like an API address. Uh, and then once you are done just pasting it, you click submit, and then it shows you the different things that are about to be imported. Uh, so in our case, we have the URL, and then we have the IP address. And then in this case, we can choose if it's destination or source IP address. So you can pick whatever you want. And if you are okay with it, then you click submit attributes and it will create the attribute automatically. I would just keep this one. This one is cool. And then there is last way to do things because you remember probably the discussion about having objects and the, the fact that exploding URL in some cases, uh, it's really interesting, especially for correlation purposes. And if you enable the different import module that you have, you can use this module to import information. So we can use the populate from button, select, for example, the URL import tool. And then in this one, you can paste multiple URLs. So I will take this one. I will take the URL from the Miss Project page, uh, like this, for example. Then I click import. And then Miss actually exploded the URL into the different components. And then I can choose what I want to save. So right now I'm about to save two URL objects where I have the full URL and a different part of that URL. I can say, for example, that I don't want to save the TLD, uh, but I want to keep the host name. I don't want to save the domain without the TLD. Uh, yeah, this is fine for me. This is cool. I don't want to save the subdomain. Uh, and I don't want to save this one. So once I'm done choosing what I want to save or not, I can hit submit. And then I have to wait a few seconds because this is done by a background job. But then you can see that we have the actual URL being imported correctly. All right, then it even says that it was enriched via the specific URL module. I will delete them all. Uh, and then I, I've, I saw something very interesting with one of the attributes that I want to talk about. And this is this small warning that we have there. So if we, if we go to the event uh, page, we can see that we have a huge warning on the top right. And it says that we have potential false positive in this event. Uh, because one of the attributes is part of uh, the list of known IPv4 public DNS resolver. And if we scroll down, it is actually this attribute. So if, if you don't know already, 8888 is uh, the public re IPv4 DNS resolver of Google. And MISP is telling us that this is probably a false positive because we have checked the IDS flag. So by checking the IDS flag, we've marked this IP address as an IOC, meaning that whenever we will like, try to export IOCs uh, for them to be fed to protective tools like firewalls, um, this IP address will be exported as well, meaning that we are about to block 8888, which is probably not something we want to do. And that's why MISP is warning us about that saying that, okay, you've considered this IP address as an IOC, this is probably a false positive. That's why we have this huge warning. And then the, the simplest way to remove that warning is simply to turn off the IDS flag. So if we turn it off, then we have to reload the page. The warning is gone. And the warning next to the value is gone as well. Because now we have the, the attribute but it, as it is not uh, considered as an IOC, this is just observable data. And this will not be exported whenever we try to, uh, to export data into a format that can be fed to productive tools. Um, then something else that we could also talk about um, is this small magnifying glass icon. So if I click on it, it is querying our enrichment service. Uh, that was mentioned previously, like the MIS module. So the enrichment service is a set of modules that are, is running in parallel to MISP. So it's like a companion tool, um, 
which allows us to perform enrichment on the data. So in this case, we have uh, enrich this IP address with the with some modules that are un unable on this instance. So on this instance, we have the ASN module, so we can get in which ASN this IP address is part of. We have the geolocation that is also returned saying that's OK. Uh, using the enrichment module, this IP address is based in the United States. So this is what we call the Hoover enrichment. When you hover over the attribute, it reveals it. But in some cases, it makes sense to also save this information into the event so that it's shared. For example, the geolocation, right now this IP address is based in the United States, but maybe in one or two years, it will not be the case anymore. Same goes for the ISN. So in some cases, it makes sense to save this information in the event so that we have all the context uh, uh, related to, to the time of the incident. So you can save information by clicking on this Add Enrichment button. So if you click on this button, you can choose uh, well which enrichment module you want to, to run against this attribute. So in our case, let's say that I want to save the geolocation. For that one, I will use the MMDB lookup. Um, this is an expansion module that we use, that we use here at Circle uh, to enrich IP address with geolocation. So if I click on this one, I have the geolocation um, of that IP address. And similar to, uh, uh, to the URL extraction part, I can choose what I want to save and what I don't want to save. So in my case, let's say I don't want to save the ISN, so I can click this checkbox on, so that it won't save the entire object. And then I'm provided two geolocation objects. Um, and in this case, they are exactly the same aside from that text. Uh, that text shows which DB version it's using. So this one is using one at 130 and this one is at two. So I will keep the latest one. So what I will do, I will turn off this one. So, so that I only save one object, one geolocation object. Then I hit submit. And I wait a few seconds, and if I scroll down, you can see that now I have the geolocation object created, and it even has a relationship directly pointing to my attribute, so that I can see it in this table. But if I go to the event graph, I can also see there the relation that was added automatically. I think this is pretty cool. Uh, to have this enrichment service. Uh, just a side note about it, um, this enrichment service is uh, running, uh, uh, well, the programming language is Python, and it's fairly easy to create new modules. For example, the URL extractor module that, you, that uh, I showed there, uh, this one, um, it was written during a, a training, uh, mm -hmm. and it was done in like 15 minutes. So if you are a bit familiar with Python, uh, and even if you are not really, if you have some basic programming skills, I mean, it's fairly easy to do. Just copy paste what already exists, modify it, and then you are good to go. Uh, and it can really helps you to do a lot of stuff. Like this URL exploding stuff, this is something that is fairly common. Uh, and people usually go the tedious way of doing it manually. I will show it to you how, how it looks like when you do it manually. So right now I'm trying to add an object. So you have to select the URL object and then you have to fill out all of these fields. So you would fill the URL, you would fill the domain, uh, you would fill the IP if you have one. Uh, this is not required. You could fill the query string. Uh, I don't have any in this one. You could fill the resource path. There we go. Um, you can see that I, it took me 30 seconds to do. So now I have my object there. It took me 30 seconds to do. But if you have 10 URL to save, uh, it's really a lot of time. So by using this, this module, uh, it's really something that uh, uh, really speed up the encoding processing, if you are using the web interface, of course. And sometime investing 30 minutes or one hour to develop one module that will save you hundreds of hours later on is really worth it. 
So, so yeah. If you ever need to perform enrichment um, or to import data, uh, I, I think it's truly worth the, the effort to have a look at it, especially that we've made a lot of effort to make it easy for everyone to, to use and to develop and extend. Um, yeah, so we have uh, open IOC import, thread connect import, Cuckoo import, uh, COF to MISP import, CSV import. Uh, yeah, this is, I guess, CSV is very popular for importing uh, and sharing list yeah, of IOCs. It's one of the questions that we have right now. Okay. Yeah, but this one is a fairly popular used module as well. Uh, and to give you ideas, for example, for the different uh, enrichment module. Um, I'm not sure if the link to the MISP module project was provided already. Uh, so I will just paste, paste it just in case. All right. Uh, but then you can see all the different modules that we currently support. Uh, so expansion in this case, so we have quite a lot. We have who is URL host, virus total, uh, Threadfox, Threadminer, Recorded Future, RiverDNS, Sigma, Shodan, OCR, well, a lot of stuff. But I mean, in some cases, it makes sense for you to develop something custom. If you have a tight integration with, for example, your ticketing system or uh, your thread management system or whatever, and MISP, uh, yeah, writing a small module that would query your internal tools to provide more information directly in the MISP interface is something fairly easy to do. Like if you are creating an attribute that links to, for example, an incident uh, or a ticket ID uh, that you have in other systems, and just by hoovering uh, the the value of the uh, the ticket ID, you would see information from your ticketing system. This is fairly common also to have uh, as integration. Um, so, um, are there any questions about things so far that I may have missed? Just one thing regarding the uh, uh, import URLs. Uh, I think the, the question was more, uh, even if it's great, great that you you show the import URLs, it was more like I have a URL containing a given uh, report, a trade intelligence report, and then I want to ingest into the other report. I see. Okay. This is a different matter. So I will go back to our collaborative uh, document for the training. And I will go to this specific example. So the Cobalos Linux thread to high performance computing infrastructure. So in this one, we have a lot of stuff. But first, let's see if the blog post already exists. Uh, okay, so this page from ESET uh, describe a malware called Cobalos that is targeting high performance computing infrastructure. So in there we have pictures, we have text, diagram, uh, some mitre attack techniques, and probably some IOCs as well somewhere. Um, and what you can do in MISP, if you enable the import module, of course, is you take the URL. As an example, I will take a new event. Test event for blog post import. You go to event report, you click on import from URL, you provide the URL, you click submit, you wait for a few seconds, and then we have our report. So it's not perfect, of course. It's a simple script that do HTML to Markdown conversion. So what you would probably need to do is to clean up a bit of stuff, like some tags that are not correctly interpreted, uh, some paragraphs that are not correctly rendered. Uh, but then you have, yeah, like the text right away in your MISP instance. Save as a report. This, been, this can be quite handy.
All right, wanted to show something, but it seems that uh, this is not supported right now. Need to investigate this one. The extract entity seems to be buggy right now. Maybe on the training instance. Um, yeah, it could be. Some people played with it, but yeah. The, the shape of this instance is not great. But yeah, anyway. Uh, and so you have your, your report there. And some something that people usually do as well is they go there, they copy the text. Oops. There we go. And then they use the free text import tool, they paste it, they submit. And if we have any IOCs, not the case on this one, but if you have any IOCs, then you would be able to extract them from the report. Um, but the reason why I wanted to show you, oh, I, thought I lost it, uh, to show you the Cobalos example is to show you the kind of report that you can build using the uh, event report if you invest a bit of time after the import. Uh, so in this case, we have some reference. When when I was mentioning uh, that it is an interactive report, uh, it means because you you have some element that you can click on to get more information about it. For example, we have this malware called Cobalos. You can see that you can click on it. And if you click on it, you have, oh, this is not, the screen is a bit too small, but you have uh, information about this specific uh, malware. Same for this one. If you click on it, uh, this is a, an IP address that belongs to an object. This is this one. And you can see the context around it. So we can see that uh, yeah, it's part of an object. And if you would have any tags or galaxies attached to it, you would see them as well. Um, in this case, we also have this one. We don't have anything about this tag. You can also have pictures that can be included in the report. Uh, a diagram. There are some other attributes and all the matrix attack, the galaxy matrix, and so on. Um, and if these are actually pictures, but if you want to have, instead of picture like a diagram, um, you can always uh, use the, um, the Markdown way. Well, one of the best way in Markdown to, to create diagram is by using uh, Mermaid. So I can just show an example, Mermaid example. And so for that, just give me one second so that I can grab a sample so that I don't figure out uh, during one hour how to... So Mehmed is an extension to Markdown to draw a graph and relationship. Um, so we have this support thing to, um, and this is a thing. So that's if you can even get a best Markdown if you need it. So it's Quite handy if you start work the documentation on the report on, on some different platform person. Yeah. I'm almost done. Give me one second. There we go. So how can I view this? Okay. Okay, got this mermaid. There we go. So that kind of stuff. So just say mermaids and then whichever the mermaid library supports you can you can use. So I um, can do cool stuff like this. I don't know if sequence diagram is supported. Yeah, it is. <laughs> can do a lot of cool stuff. So if you just want to play with mermaids, it's pretty great. Uh, can even do pie chart, user journey. It's pretty good. It's a quick way to avoid uh, having to submit the actual picture and then uh, importing it. So if you need more documentation on how to use this editor and so on, simply have to click on help and then you have help uh, and explanation about the format, some shortcut and the plugin supported. Okay, so if, is there anything we, we should cover be, be, before going to the, to the actual demo of the encoding? No, I think we can go straight to the demo then. All right, so 
have for you uh, something that we usually use as a, as an exercise, but instead of asking you to to do stuff, uh, I will try. Uh, well, we will do it as a demo. So we'll start from uh, a simple a simple exercise. Uh, and then a simple incident, test incident, and then we'll encoding live. Okay, so uh, give me a minute. Let me try to find to find it back. So up. This is not it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, there we go. This one up. So what we have is a simple uh, encoding exercise, uh, which is about ransomware infection via email. Uh, so it, we have a small chronology. So we have at the beginning, at this specific time, uh, we have a, a, the fact that an email containing a specific ransomware from supposedly this person uh, was sent. Uh, yeah, a few minutes later, the email was read and its attachment was open and executed. And then malware, the malware that got executed added persistence. And then the malware was successfully, uh, has successfully conducted the C2 and got the public key. Public key was saved in the registry. The malware began the encryption process. And at the end, the victim contacted the police. Um, so from this small chronology, we have extracted some evidences, for example, the email received by the victim, uh, the attachment, some Windows registry, the public keys, some capture of network traffic and so on. And from these evidences, we can extract data that we can use and we can encode in MISP. For example, the original email, the actual ransom binary, the registry key, the public key, uh, some IP addresses, a Bitcoin address, and a person that was impersonated. So we have this email. So we have the whole content of the email. We have the binary. We have uh, an IP address, a registry key, uh, a XOR key used to like uh, crypt informa encrypt information and a public key used to encrypt the, the, the data on disk. A Bitcoin address and um, the person email uh, that got impersonated. And in this exercise, the task are the following. So you have to create an event and call the data and so on. But what we will do today is to, we will do it together. So First thing uh, that you have to do when you want to encode information is to start by creating the envelope, so the event. Uh, as we mentioned previously, you cannot have floating attributes or floating objects, basically objects uh, or entities that don't belong to an event. In MISP, they always uh, attribute an object always are in, inside an event. So this is the first thing we have to do. So let's go back in our MISP instance. Oops. And then let's start by creating an event. So to do that, you go on the event list event page, you click on add event. Then you have to provide information about that event, such as the date, uh, the distribution, and optionally thread level and analysis. So let's start by that. Uh, right now, I will I will set the distribution to be my organization only, so that uh, I have time to properly encode things. And then once I'm done, I will change the distribution to something more lax, such as this community 
or connected communities. Now you may ask yourself, oh, well, what does that mean? What does community mean? What does connected community mean? And for that, I refer you to the cheat sheet uh, in the distribution section. So in this one, it explains what it actually means. So organizationally means that it's only visible to the member of your organization. Um, so if I'm part of the circle organization in MISP and I create an event under the organization only distribution level, only member of my organization, meaning me and my colleague Alex, would be able to see it. If I use this community, this means all organizations that have access to this MISP instance. So basically, anyone that have access to the to, to, to this specific MISP. When I choose connected communities, it means all of the above, so all of the organization from this MISP instance, but also all instance currently synchronizing with the current one. So if this node at n equals zero would be my MISP instance, if I'm using connected communities and we have two other MISP instances connected and synchronizing with mine, then these ones would also receive the data. And finally, if I use all communities, it means all of the above, but the synchronization is not restricted to only one node away. So data would be synchronized to the connected MISP instance, but it, will, it would continue to synchronize uh, as long as it can. And finally, sharing group is, this is a special case. Um, sharing groups allows you to list which organization can have access to the data um, and potentially to which instances you want the sharing group to be synchronized to. Uh, but yeah, if you set it to a sharing group, only this organization, organization would be able to see. So now if we go back to our events, I will choose my organization only so that I have time to encode and then I will increase uh, the distribution so that more people can see it. Thread level is a bit historical, I would say. Uh, it's, it was used to express uh, the thread level of a specific malware. Uh, some people are still using it, um, but now if you want to be more precise, it's better to use tag from taxonomies instead. So in my case, I would just use medium. Analysis is a way for us to specify our current state of analysis of the event. So if it's an incident, how far we've gotten into the analysis process. Uh, again, if you want to be more precise, I refer you to using tags from taxonomies. Right now, I would just pick ongoing. And finally, the last thing I will have to encode is the event info field. So basically the title of the event. Um, so in this specific case, um, uh, we had uh, this one, which is quite quite okay, I think. Ransomware, ransomware infection via email. Um, usually for recommendation that I would give to for giving a proper event title, it would be to first make it concise, concise and self-explanatory so that whenever you are viewing the event list, by reading the text, you already know what this is about. For example, fail spear phishing attempt targeting telco company Luxembourg. This is very telling of what's going on. If I have a look at uh, spear phishing, it is it could be better. Let's say <laughs> my incident is the worst. Like you cannot say anything. You don't know what this is about. So now that I've picked a title, I can hit submit. It says that the event has been saved, and you can see that a lot of of stuff already happened in the background. So by default, the organization I'm part of, this is the training organization, this is my organization on, on this instance, uh, has been assigned to this event. Uh, you can see that some tags were added automatically. This is a configuration of the instance. So by default, whenever you create an event on this training instance, it will attach automatically these tags. Uh, in this case, uh, I want to get rid of them. Yes, but this one I will keep it. The workflow state draft, it's a good alternative to the analysis that we have there. 
saying that right now the state of this event is draft. Then we have some warnings. So it says that uh, we don't have any attributes on our object, so we don't have any content. Uh, and that's basically it, actually. Yep. OK, so now we have an event that is completely empty. So we could start uh, by encoding stuff. So let's head back to our example and let's see what we have. First, we have this email. So we could encode this email. So what I will do is, um, so what do we have? We have a subject, we have the text, and we have uh, a, the, a from section. Um, I mean, this would be three attributes. And when you have three attributes that are related to each other, it's always preferable to use an object. So for this one, I will use an object directly. So I have first to pick the category in which your object is in. Uh, to be honest with you, I never know in which category uh, object are, so I always pick all objects and then I use this uh, drop down and search for uh, the thing I'm looking for, so in this case, email. Then I have a quick look at the requirement for creating a valid email object. So to create one valid, it has to have at least one of these attributes listed there. Uh, so we have the subject. I could encode the subject. We have the BCC we don't have. The two, do we have a two? We don't have a two. But we have a from. So I can put from. Um, yeah, I could even do this so that it's even better. There we go. Email body, we have the body. Uh, I could even add the attachment. I could add the IP source if I if I have it, but I don't. So that's fine. If I had headers, I could send headers. But I'm pretty happy with this one. So I can click on submit, and then it's my time to review uh, before creating the object. Uh, so it looks good to me. So I can click on create new object. And if I scroll down, now I can see my object. Perfect. So what's next? What's next is this CryptoLocker binary. So for this one, I have it uh, on my desktop already. Nope. Just searching for it. Right. So now to encode uh, a malware or basically to encode any attachment, um, you have to go to add attachment on the uh, left side panel. When you click on this one, you will be provided a small form that you have to fill. It's pretty, pretty simple. You have to pick which category we are in. So in this case, uh, I could say that it's payload installation. I can pick the distribution for that specific malware. So in this case, I will take inherit event so that it has the same distribution as the event. Um, I can add a contextual comment. This is something that is good for analysts, but it's not, uh, I guess, not required. But I like to, to provide a bit of information in there so that whenever I, uh, I go back to the event, I always know what this is about. Uh, and yes, yeah, sometimes saving like text uh, along with the context is always good. So yeah, having the ransomware attached to the mail is not that bad. And later on, uh, I will create the relationship between the actual mail and the actual ransomware and express the fact that this ransomware was attached to the initial mail. Um, then I have to provide the file that I want to submit to MISP. So in my case, update CryptoLocker, put it there. And then this is the most important part. I have to make sure that this checkbox is a malware sample is checked. Uh, because right now we are in the interface that allows us to submit attachment. 
by attachment, it can be malware samples, but it can also be like Word documents, PDF documents, pictures, and whatever. But in our case, as we are submitting a malware sample, and by checking this is a malware sample checkbox, we are asking MISP to perform additional, uh, let's say, handling of the data. So I will upload it, and you will see what I mean by additional handling of the data. We can see that in addition to having just created the malware sample, like the binary file as an attribute, it also computed the different file hashes of that uh, binary. And it created an object out of it. So that now we have everything correctly encoded, everything correctly structured, and I can say that these file hashes belong to this object, to this binary. This is perfect. So let's continue. What else do we have? We have an IP address. So I could take this IP address and I could either go to the painful way of manually selecting all of these things, or I can be lazy, just click on this one, paste the IP address, click submit, review that it is indeed, uh, what is it again? This is the IP address of C2 server used to generate. So this is the IP contacted from uh, by the malware. So in this case, oops, uh, I could say destination and then submit. And that's it. I have my IP address. Didn't have to fill out all of these. So quick and easy. Um, I could even provide more information. I will just edit it and add as a contextual, contextual comment that this IP address, uh, this is the IP address of a C2 used to generate the secret key. This will be useful later on when I will encode the relationship. Next, we have few registry keys um, that were used to add persistence, that were used to uh, uh, store the configuration data of the malware, but also was used to store the public key used for encryption. So for this one, let's encode these. So we just take this one. And then in this case, there are multiple things that I could do. I could add an attribute uh, and use this reg key. But using object always has advantages, such as creating relationship, but also excluding some parts uh, for correlation purposes. So in my case, I would prefer to use an object once again. So I don't know in which category it's in, uh, but I know that I'm looking for a registry key. And then I just need to fill to fill out this form. So I have the full key pass. Oops. Then I also have the data store in there. And then the root key, the root key is HKCU. Uh, the name of the registry key will be run. And this is a ready word. All right. I could set a first in and last in, but in this case, I don't know about it, so I will leave it empty. I can hit submit, quickly review it. Everything looks good. I can create the object. Now let's move on to the second one. Um, actually, I could even have, oops, added more information about this one. So I will provide the contextual comment saying that this register key is used for persistence update object. So you can see updating information that was already encoded is straightforward. Now for the registry key that contain the configuration data. So same, same discussion as before, let's use an object. So this one, registry key, and I have the full key. There we go. Uh, the name is this one. And this is H, HKCU, and this looks good to me. So 
Now we are in the review interface and you can see that BISP is warning us that, hey, be careful. In this event, you already have an object that is similar to this one. Um, this is a good way in case we were about to duplicate data. So it tells us that this attribute, HKCU, uh, already exists somewhere because we have it there. But these ones, these entries are different. So in this case, uh, we have a similarity of 33. Uh, and obviously, we know from the, from the start that this is a different uh, object that we are trying to encode. But in, if we were in the case where uh, we would be encoding the same object, uh, then we would see immediately a almost 100% match. Uh, and so we can just ignore the creation of this object. But this is a new one, so we can save it. And we can go to the last one, which is uh, the one used uh, to store the public key received from the C2 server. And actually, I forgot to add the comment for this one, so let's quickly do it. Yep. And last but not least, oops, this is not a regex, small mistake. Registry key. So we have the full key, we have the name of the registry key. Then this is this one. Um, and so in this case, you see that I have the, the public key that is there. So what I could do is to put it in the data section. But actually what I will do is something slightly different. I will create a dedicated object slash attribute for this one and create a relationship. But I mean, you could also have put the data of the public key there. It's just that I prefer to put it in a separate one. All right. So again, it's warning me that be careful. There is there are objects in this event that are really similar to the one you are about to create. Uh, for example, this one is telling me that hey, only the name of the registry key is different. Maybe you are encoding the same the same object over. But we know that for a fact that it's not the case, these are different. So I can proceed and confirm the creation. Um, and then we have the two cryptographic keys, so the XOR key there, and the public key, the Bitcoin, and the person remaining. Um, so for this, this one, uh, I will use again another uh, object. And this one is called crypto material. This is a really cool object that allows you to, to save and encode a large variety of different uh, cryptographic uh, elements used for encryption. So in this case, we have, um, where is it? We have a symmetry, there we go, a symmetry key. So this one. And we know that uh, it is XOR that is used type, and this is XOR. I can submit, review that everything is fine, and then I can create it. And there we go, we have our wonderful uh, XOR King credit. And I can do exactly the same, it's not this one, I can do exactly the same for that public key used to encrypt the files. So I can take it. I can go back to the object to encode crypto material. But this time, this is not encryption using XOR. This is encryption using uh, public key. So I could use type, uh, I guess it's this one. And then this is not symmetric, this is public. And there we go can submit uh, and then create it. And we have our public key encoded. Uh, Bitcoin address. Bitcoin address. This could be one standalone attribute, but the advantage of having objects instead of attributes 
is better, especially for the relationship part. So I will add also an object. But actually, let's let's do, let's do it differently. Let's use an attribute, and I will show you a nice trick. Um, this is financial fraud. Uh, we could mark it as being fed to IDS system. So right now I've created an attribute of type Bitcoin. But if I want to change it into an object, um, you can always do it via this interface. For that, you just need to check this box. And then you can see you, can, you have some action that pops up. And if you click on this one called group selected attributes into an object, you can choose an object from this list for which you want to convert the attribute into. So in our case, I will pick the coin address. This is an object, as it says by the description, uh, that can be used uh, to save address use in cryptocurrency. So I can click on this one. Uh, this is absolutely fine. This is the address. I can click merge our attribute into an object and poof, I have my object. So quick and dirty way to encode information, you could use the free text import tool, like this one. You submit your IP address and your domain name, and then you select them with the checkbox and you convert them into an object, quick and easy. All right, and last one is the person. So for the person, we have, oops, a name, a first name, an email address, and some, let's say, roles. So these could be all attributes, but in this case, we would like to have them together in the same object. And so we'll use an object to encode this. So I go there. I don't know which category, but it's OK. I can pick all object, and then I can say that I want to encode a person. Uh, then what do we have to encode? We have a full name. Uh, full name there. I could even explode it like this. We have an email address. Do we have an email address? We do. Um, what do we have? A content, suspect, victim, originator. So a lot of roles. So we have victims. We have suspect. But you can see that right now I only have one. But you can also notice that we have this small arrow that is a bit hidden. If you click on this arrow, it expands it and allows you to enter more. This is the same when you're trying to encode like a domain IP or a file. Uh, in some cases, you can have multiple attributes for that specific, uh, let's say, attributes, uh, the specific concept. Because in this case, a person can have multiple roles. So it was a victim, it was, uh, what was it again? Uh, I remember origin originator. And it is also a victim that's done. And it is also a suspect. All right. Seems good. I can hit submit. Quickly review it. Everything seems fine. I can create the object. And there we go. Now we have encoded everything. But there is something I want to make sure to do is not to, let's say, leak information. Because right now, this one can be shared freely, this one as well. But in this case, maybe as this uh, Andrew Ryan seems to be a victim, maybe it's not a good idea to share this information with smart partners. So to make sure that I'm not oversharing, I will change the distribution setting of that object, entire object, to your organization only. So that even if I change the distribution setting of the event, this, this, this object will still be under the organization only distribution and it will not be visible by others. This is a trick that you could use also if you want to add some attributes or objects that are referring to your internal infrastructure or system like ticket ID, uh, incident ID or whatever. So that you have the reference of your, uh, your uh, 
like incident in your MISP event, but the others don't see it. Okay, this is fairly good in my opinion. Uh, I think we've covered most of it, right? Uh, so what we could do is maybe add an event report just to explain the situation. So I like to do it quick and easy once again. So we have the chronology there. Uh, and what I could do is just copy paste it like this. And let's say incident chronology. And in this case, if it was involving uh, information that I don't want to disclose, uh, I could change the distribution setting once again. So either I change this reference to Andrew Ryan, like uh, supposedly the victim, let's say, or I could change the distribution setting. So in, our, in my case, I will just keep inherit event so that I have just the chronology out there. Weirdly enough, it doesn't do it correctly. I will just do this. Up, up, up. There we go. I can save, go back to the event. And this looks good, perfect. I could even provide more information such as, I don't know, an executive summary of the incident or even the technical details. Uh, but yeah, let's not do that right now. Let's now focus on actually creating all the relationship that we have uh, to, to create this graph that tells, that tells a story. So we could start from the start. <laughs> Um, and open the event graph because you can add references using this add reference button where you have to select the type of the relationship and then to which entity you want the, as a target. But I prefer to work using this graph, this graph view. I can make it full screen. And then right now I'm viewing all the attributes that don't that don't have a reference and all the objects that don't have a reference. Uh, if you need, want to know the shortcut that you can use, you can over over this small uh, question mark character, and it will show you the shortcuts. And the the most interesting one are X to expand the node, C to collapse it, and Shift to quickly create relationship. So if I select this node and I press X, it will show me the attribute that is under reference. Same from these objects. If I press X, I will see all the objects. Okay, so let's start by adding a reference. So we have first this person, victim, uh, or suspect, Mr. Ryan, that is sending an email, this one. So to do that, I can click Edit, Add Reference, and then click on the first node and drag until the second one. And then I can pick the relation type. So what is the relationship between these two? So what I want to express is the fact that this person sends this email. So I can search for send and I see that I have send, send to, send seems good to me. So I send and click submit. Then we have to wait a bit and there we go. We have our relationship created and I can proceed. This email, it was containing a malware called the CryptoLocker malware, this one. So in the event where I would have two or multiple files, you can always click on it, press X to expand, and so you can see the different attributes. So in this case, you could see the, the complete file name. So this is indeed the one. And what I want to express is say that this file was included in this mail, or you can do it also the other way around, say that this email contain this file. So instead of clicking on edit and then add the reference, you can just press the shift key and you can see that it's shift uh, uh, the editor into the add reference mode so that you can immediately do this. So I can say that this file uh, 
uh, this email, sorry, contain this file. No. But I can also do it the other way around and say that this file is contain because I saw the content within uh, contain within this email address, uh, this email. Um, yeah, that's that doesn't look too bad. What do we know? Um, we also know that this file was connecting to this IP address, that it was adding persistence, fetching configuration, and doing some encryption. So let's start with the easy one. Let's start with connecting to the IP address. So the IP address was encoded as an attribute there. So I could say that this one, um, connect, what do we have for connect? Connects or connects to this IP address. Good. So we could also say uh, that these registry keys were written by this file. So I can take them. There we go. And I can add this relationship and say that this file is writing so this one, this one, and the last one. looks good. What else do we still need for our story? We have these, these two keys, which are represented there as crypto material. So I could say that this, uh, this one, if I'm not wrong, it is used by the version info. So this one, because if I extend, I can see the name version info. So I can say that this uh, cryptographic key is used by. Oh, actually, it would, would have been the other way around. So it would have been. Whoops. Oh, I need to do it the other way around. So saying that it's used by. There we go. Okay, um, we have this crypto material, this public key, and this one we know that it is being, uh, let's say, stored, uh, stored in. So let's try to add this stored in. Oh, we don't have the verb, like the, the, the specific relationship type that we want to create. Um, usually we recommend people to use the one that are existing. But in the event where you cannot find one, um, you can always cheat and use the custom relationship type that allows you to type whatever you want. So in this case, I want to say like uh, stored in. This is a nice trick if you want to like export things that are not available by default. And then we have one coin address remaining. This one um, is used by uh, the crypto locker, let's say, to request money. Uh, I'm not sure how we can link them together. Uh, maybe link it to the person used by. Yeah, this sounds good. And there we go, we have our graph. So let's rearrange the node a bit. Up, up, there we go. All the registry key, the crypto materials that will be there. This looks good to me. So now that I have a good view, I can choose to save the state of the graph. Let's call it just state one. It's saved. And now if I reload the page, go to my event graph, you can see that Everything is a bit unreadable, but I can always restore the state of the graph so that it's easier for me to read. It's not too bad. Okay, so we are almost done, but let's check 
the tasks that we have to do. So first we were asked to create an event. We were asked to encode all data to be shared, um, add the relationship to recreate the story, add the time component to recreate the chronology. So I could do it, uh, to be honest with you, I will, I'm a bit lazy to do it today. So I will skip it. Um, then perform the enrichment where applicable. Ah, this is something that we could do. So we have a person, crypto material, XOR key, file, email, coin address. What does it say? Just curious. So we can even see that this Bitcoin wallet has some transaction. So 40 transaction, uh, almost 45 Bitcoin went in, 45, 55, sorry, went out. So this account is empty now. It is always cool to see. So if, if we wanted, we could also save this information in the event. But that's not for this one. Let's save the information of the IP and its geolocation. So similar as we did before, we can click on Add Enrichment and then MMDB Lookup. I can see that this IP address is based in Russia. Um, I will take the latest version of the database, which is the second one. And this time I will keep the ASN. Can hit submit. Uh, I have to wait a few seconds uh, for the enrichment module to return and save the data. And once we have it, the objects are there. And I can even check in the event graph. I can reload. And I can even check now we have the IP address and the ASN and the geolocation were added automatically with the relationship co correctly created. Good. Okay. So we added some enrichment and now we have to, uh, to add, I think one of the most important uh, thing to do after, uh, well, after encoding the data, which is the context. Um, so, what could we add? So we could be completely crazy about it um, and add, add tons of context. Uh, but if you are part of a community, usually the best would be to check what the community is using. So what type of classification they are using and stick to this one. Um, so in our case, uh, let's say that I'm encoding uh, this incident for my constituency, so I will use the circle classification. But you could use the ENISA classification if you are part of uh, if you are part of the ENISA constituency. You could use the Europol incident. Uh, we have classification from various countries and organizations. And in the event where you would you 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 would be missing one, you can always create it uh, yourself. This is quite easy to do, to be fair. But okay, let's go and add information about the incident and use the circle classification. So uh, we will add a tag. To add a tag, just click on this small button called add a tag. Uh, and then you have to select from which taxonomy you want to use, uh, you want to take a tag from. Quick reminder, taxonomy are, taxonomies are libraries of tags that are globally understood by everyone. So in my case, I will take the circle taxonomy and you can see I can I have some tags that are already there. Uh, so in my case, I could take incident classification around somewhere. This is exactly what this is. This uh, incident is about. Uh, but just to show you in case you would be to use another uh, taxonomy, let's say, for example, the ENISA one, uh, where is it there? I could search for ENISA, and then in my case, maybe I can search for ransomware. Oh, perfect. Activity abuse ransomware. That's something that I could do. Um, what else could we add? Um, if, okay, let's, let's follow the, the list so that it's, we don't forget anything. So we've added the, the type of incident if we are in the case of incident. Then I think 
the second most important thing, or maybe it should be actually the first, is to add classification regarding the releaseability and the permissible action that you can do with the data. So if you are not familiar with the TLP protocol and the PAP protocol, P, uh, TLP is uh, uh, like uh, classification to express how you can release the data and to whom it can be released to. And PAP is a classification to express what you can do with the data once you receive it. So let's have a look and let's add a tag from the TLP taxonomy. So we can see that we have some tags. For example, if we were to add the TLP red, it means that this information is for the eyes and ears of individual recipient only, no further disclosure. Uh, this is not like this event that we've created, this incident is not really that kind of classification. I would, I would say this incident and the data contained within it um, should be used by our, our organization and partner to protect themselves without releasing it to like global internet. So in this case, I think I would pick the TAP green, which means limited disclosure recipient can spread within their community, which seems adapt, uh, I think, at least for that uh, specific incident. Then we need to add the PAP one. So for PAP, it is really similar to TLP, but this is not about who can access the data, it's about what you can do with the data. To give an example, if we look at PAP red, it says that you can do non-detectable action only. So you can only take passive action on logs that are not detectable from the outside. And if we take the other extreme, which is PAP white, it says no restriction using this information. I think PAP red is a bit too extreme uh, and PAP white, uh, we could discuss it. I would go for PAP white or maybe TLP Ember, the uh, PAP Ember. PAP Ember says that we can uh, uh, ping the targets, block incoming or coming traffic. Uh, yeah, I would take this one probably. But this this discussion of picking the correct PAP and TLP uh, always come back to the community you are in and what what is the role in which uh, in this community. Okay, so what else do we have then? If we are part of a malware, if a malware is involved, then uh, we could also add information about the malware, the malware classification. Uh, so for that, we have a taxonomy dedicated to that. It's called malware classification. And then we know that this is a ransomware. Uh, do we have do we have something else about ransomware? Locker ransomware, this is oh crypto ransomware, this is good. So we can be even more precise. Okay, and then what was the other one? Um, ransomware. Uh, so oops, we also have a dedicated taxonomy about ransomware. This is so common. Uh, Ransomware is so common that uh, we have a dedicated one. I was actually already use crypto ransomware, but we have other things uh, like complexity, purpose, we could add purpose, <laughs> uh, infection. And in our case, this is an infection via email, so we could say that it's infected via phishing emails. Once we are happy with that, uh, with the taxonomies, we can move to the galaxies. So remember, galaxies, they are uh, also like taxonomies in the sense that they are normalized, normalized libraries, but they contain more meta information to it. Uh, something that we haven't talked about regarding uh, galaxies is that we also have the support of synonyms. I don't know if you are familiar with how uh, vendors name, for example, the different uh, uh, malwares, but, or, or even threat actors, uh, but they don't have always the same name. So depending on the vendor, you would have different names. Uh, I will give an example for uh, a threat actor. Let's take, for example, the very common one. Let's take this one, APT29. 
So you can see that we have some synonyms like cozy beer, beer, and sea dukes, grizzly, and so on. So if I were to search for APT29, oops, APT29, it appears in the search. But if I were to search for cozy beer, it would also appear because it's a synonym. And it's the same for malware. Just good to know. This is why we also have the metadata associated to the clusters. Okay, so what type of galaxy could we add? Uh, do we have a sector? Hmm, we don't. Do we have a country? We don't. Hmm, tough luck. Maybe we should change the exercise to include these two information. But anyway, we have um, we have the malware, so we know that it's a crypto locker. So we have support of Malpedia. Malpedia is a, it's a very good uh, uh, library containing a lot of information about malware. And for this one, we could look for crypto locker. Perfect. So I could use Malpedia. I could also use uh, the galaxy of ransomware because I told you it's so common that uh, we also have a dedicated taxonomy for ransomware and not for all malwares and I'm sure CryptoLocker is also part of it so we even have the version um, yeah and last but not least would be all the mitre attack so all the technique used by the attackers uh, do I have compiled a list um, no, I haven't. <laughs> All right. This, I think this is one of the, the contextualization part that takes the most time uh, to figure out all the attack pattern used. Um, but yeah. So what do we have? Do we have anything related to registry key? Registry. Uh, credential in the registry. This is not too bad. Modify registry. This is not too bad as well. So let's take these ones. Uh, what do we have? Mm. Do we have something with spear phishing? Oh, spear phishing message. Spear phishing attachment. This is not too bad. Hmm? Encrypting data. This is good. Encrypted channel. Exfiltration. Uh, data encrypted for impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, encrypted channel. No, not really. Uh, what do we have about cryptography? Oh, perfect. Symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. We have the two. Um, um, yeah. So this is not too bad already. We could take even more time, but this is not the purpose of this exercise today. So let's do this. But yeah, one of the main advantage whenever you are uh, adding this attack pattern is that it's helping both you and the recipient of that data. Because first of all, you would be able to extract some statistics to generate stuff like thread landscape reporting. Uh, you would be able to better filter uh, the data when you want to feed your productive tools. Um, and also if everyone is doing it, uh, it's also a good, good way for you to lead the example and to show the example to other organizations on how to do things. Uh, but if, if many organizations and many of these events that you create are using these, um, when you aggregate data, you can see gaps that, uh, for example, some techniques that you are not able to, to like, uh, uh, detect uh, or act on. Uh, I could leak, list others, but I don't have anything that comes to my mind right now. Um, okay, so it's not too bad. I mean, we have contextualized the envelope, so the event, but we could go even the next step, and that would be to also contextualize um, uh, actual attributes. Uh, for that, we could add some type. All right. So as I was saying, we can also add more information about the file. So this crypto locker, we could also say that uh, this one uh, is doing some ransomware activities. 
Um, so this is not a cluster. This is uh, like using the ransomware taxonomy uh, and say that, uh, I don't know, do we have um, encryption? No, not really. So what could we use? Do we have a purpose? Ah, but that's not too bad. They apply that ransomware extraction, for example. Okay, and so in this one we could encode like and provide more uh, more classification to this specific uh, ransomware. Um, another one that I haven't shown yet is uh, the Mac classification for malware capabilities. Um, if you are really into like malware information sharing, this one is pretty good to uh, list the different capabilities of malwares. For this one, we know that it had persistence, so we could say that this one is adding some persistence. Um, we also know that uh, it communicates with the C2 server uh, to, to get back its configuration. So if we search for C2, we communicate with C2 server, and we could list other capabilities, but let's, let's say that it's enough. Um, uh, yes, yes. Another one that can be useful, not to contextual information, but to request uh, operation to do by your colleagues, is to use the taxonomy called collaborative intelligence. And with collaborative intelligence, you can request information from others. For example, this in this uh, scenario, we have this registry key, which is used to store configuration data of the malware, but we don't have the configuration data. So what we could do is to ask for our colleague to extract the configuration or to, to, to encode the configuration. So I've just searched for this one, this registry key, and I could ask my colleague by using the collaborative intelligence taxonomy to get the extracted malware config. So this is something that you could do as well. Um, yeah, I think the last one that would be really interesting would be to add more information about this IP address. So we know that it is a C2. And for this one, I really like to use the taxonomy adversary. It has a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and in, for this one, I want to specify that it is a C2. Now you could say that it's a bit redundant with the command that I have here. So I've added a tag that's uh, saying that it's, it is a C2, but I've also added a comment. Now the difference between the two is that this one you can filter. Uh, first of all, it is coming from a taxonomy, so it's globally understood and automation is fairly easy to do. But this one, comments, you cannot really act on it. Uh, searching in command is pretty tedious, uh, and for filtering purposes, it's really a nightmare uh, because it's free text, and so everybody can put whatever they want. So relying on tags for filtering is way better. So if you know that it is a C2, just add it right away. Uh, yeah, we could add more context saying that, for example, uh, uh, the mail is, uh, <coughs> is the actual dropper of the ransomware uh, binary, but yeah. I think contextualization wise, we are good now. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with it. So what does the task, or the list of tasks says? Create a small write-up as an event report. And due to time constraint, we'll skip this part. And let's go to the final part, which is reviewing the distribution level and the publishing. So reviewing the distribution, what does it mean? By first, it means checking the distribution of the event. Right now, uh, if I were to publish the event, uh, it would only be visible for my organization, which is not what I want. I want all the users and all organizations on this MISP instance to view the data, but I also want my partners uh, or uh, yeah, other organizations connected via other MISP instances 
to get this information. So first, I will edit the event and change the distribution and set it to, for example, connected communities. Then I can hit submit. Next would be to review um, the, the distribution of the different attributes that I have. IOC, uh, IOC is, uh, is fine, registry keys is fine. Uh, and then the person that I probably don't want to disclose, uh, make sure that I'm restricting the distribution for my organization only. And this seems pretty, pretty good. So now the last part is publishing. So what does publishing mean? Uh, when you publish an event, right now you can see it's not published. When you publish it, um, three things happen. The first one, you start uh, and you, well, you bootstrap the synchronization process and this event will be synchronized to other MISP instance connected to this one. The second thing is emailing notification. So any organization connected that have uh, any organization having access to this event uh, will get uh, a notification by mail saying that a new event was published. And the third thing, uh, uh, track of the thing, the th ah, yes, is to make the data exposed to the API, especially the uh, data meant for feeding your productive tools. Because right now, if you try to export the data uh, into, like I said, Snort rules or Suricata, you, you would not get anything because the event is not published. So I will hit publish event. The job has been queued. I have to wait a few seconds. And if I reload, now I can see that my uh, event has been published. Now, what happens is, uh, what happens if, for example, you notice a mistake? For example, this uh, registry key, let's say you don't want, you want it to have the IDS flag check or the other way around. You don't want to have the IDS flag check for that attribute. If you change it, you will see that the event has been unpublished and you have the date uh, from the last time it was published. Uh, this is to make sure that everyone uh, has the latest information whenever you change something. So now that you have modified the event, you need to republish it again. So you can choose between two options. First one would be publish event, the same option that we, uh, that we used previously, or publish no email. So the difference between the two, I think is pretty obvious. It does the same, but the second one do not send email notification. So in this case, if you change something minor, such as this one, you would just use publish no email. Job queued, you have to wait for a few seconds. And then the event is published. And that's pretty much it, I think, for the demo. So I think we are right on time, actually, five minutes before the end. Um, so now we can take any questions, either uh, like in the chat, uh, if you want to to ask it, uh, um, uh, ask it. Uh, you, you can raise your hand, and we can give you the floor as well. We just have one question in the in the chat. Um, it's about uh, galaxy cluster, and it's a pretty good question. Is when you fork uh, cluster values and you add a synonym, uh, I wanted to know if it's a distinct cluster with its own aliases or its uh, separated aliases. Okay, that's a good question. So, and it's actually a pretty advanced one because forking cluster is really advanced usage uh, of MISP and advanced usage of contextualization. Um, so if you fork a cluster and you add synonyms, uh, it, will, it will also appear in the list when you are searching for the synonym. The only thing that you have to make sure is to actually publish whenever you, tr whenever you change uh, clusters. So uh, just to make sure there is no misunderstanding, I will just show it quickly. Uh, let's take, I don't know. What do we have there? Okay, let's take this one. This is a cluster. Let's say that I want to have a different view of this cluster. Let's call it Notion 2. Um, 
What I can do is also to add a C not name, uh, and for example, I could uh, call it uh, this one. Save change. I can submit. But if I try now to use this cluster, <laughs> oops, this one, to use this cluster in my event, so this one is uh, online service. You will see that you cannot use it because it's not published. You can only use cluster that have been published. So if I click on publish cluster, I have to wait similar to the event. Now it's published. And now if I try again, oops, I say online service. Now I can use it. I hope that helps. <laughs> okay, so good to go. Maybe you can take the last questions. questions. Mm -hmm. Or to modify Galaxy and add the nails, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we will uh, close the session for today. Uh, thanks a lot for the whole participating to the event, especially the one that asked a lot of questions and uh, we try to answer her live. Uh, we set the chat and we might have some additional links and so on at the end. And the complete uh, sessions will be online on YouTube, including the chat logs and all the details and the materials. Um, tomorrow we have second sessions, uh, more into administration aspect and so on, in API. Um, so for the ones that are interested, uh, you are more than welcome. Same thing, it's an online link and you can just like go Zoom and uh, link it and just connect to it. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone.